Let me ask about uh, Jan LeCun. He's somebody who uh, you've had a few exchanges with. <laughs> and uh, he's somebody who actively pushes back against this view that AI is going to lead to destruction of uh, human civilization, also known as uh, AI doomerism. So uh, in a, one example that he tweeted, he said, uh, I do acknowledge risks, but two points. One, open research and open source are the best ways to understand and mitigate the risks. And two, AI is not something that just happens. We build it. We have agency in what it becomes. Hence, we control the risks. We meaning humans. It's not some sort of natural phenomena that uh, we have no control over. So can you, can you make the case that he's right? And can you try to make the case that he's wrong? I cannot make a case that he's right. He's wrong in so many ways. It's difficult for me to remember all of them. Uh, he is a Facebook buddy, so I have a lot of fun uh, having those little debates with him. So I'm trying to remember the arguments. So one, he, he says we are not gifted this intelligence from aliens. We are designing it. We are making decisions about it. That's not true. It was true when we had expert systems, symbolic AI, decision trees. Today. You set up parameters for a model and you water this plant. You give it data, you give it compute, and it grows. And after it's finished growing into this alien plant, you start testing it to find out what capabilities it has. And it takes years to figure out, even for existing models. If it's trained for six months, it will take you two, three years to figure out basic capabilities of that system. We still discover new capabilities in systems which are already out there. So that's, that's not the case. So just to linger on that, to you the difference there that there is some level of emergent intelligence that happens in our current approaches. So stuff that we don't hard code in. Absolutely, that's what makes it so successful. Then we had to painstakingly hard code in everything. We didn't have much progress. Now just spend more money and more compute and it's a lot more capable. And then the question is, when there is emergent intelligent phenomena, what is the ceiling of that? For you, there's no ceiling. For uh, for Jan LeCun, I think there's a kind of ceiling that happens that we have full control over. Even if we don't understand the internals of the emergence, how the emergence happens, there's a sense that we have control and an understanding of the approximate ceiling of capability, the limits of the capability. Let's say there is a ceiling. It's not guaranteed to be at the level which is competitive with us, it may be greatly superior to ours. So what about his statement about open research and open source are the best ways to understand and mitigate the risks? Historically, he's completely right. Open source software is wonderful. It's uh, tested by the community, it's debugged, but we're switching from tools to agents. Now you're giving open source weapons to psychopaths. Do we want to open source nuclear weapons? biological weapons. It's not safe to give technology so powerful to those who may misalign it, even if you are successful at somehow getting it to work in the first place in a friendly manner. But the difference with nuclear weapons, AI, current AI systems are not akin to nuclear weapons. So the idea there is you're open sourcing it at this stage, that you can understand it better. Large, large number of people can explore the limitations, the capabilities, explore the possible ways to keep it safe, to keep uh, it's secure, all that kind of stuff, while it's not at the stage of nuclear weapons. So nuclear weapons, there's a no nuclear weapon, and then there's a nuclear weapon. With AI systems, there's a gradual improvement of capability, and you get to uh, perform that improvement incrementally. And so open source allows you to study uh, how things go wrong, a study the, the very process of emergence, a study AI safety on those systems when there's not a high level of danger, all that kind of stuff. It also sets a very wrong precedent. So we open sourced model one, model two, model three, nothing ever bad happened. So obviously we're gonna do it with model four. It's just gradual improvement. I, I don't think it always works with the precedent. Like you're not stuck doing it the way you always did. It's just, uh, it's, it sets a precedent of open research and open development such that we get to learn together. And then the first time there's a sign of danger, some dramatic thing happened, not a thing that destroys human civilization, but 
some dramatic demonstration of capability that can legitimately lead to a lot of damage, then everybody wakes up and says, okay, we need to regulate this. We need to come up with safety mechanism that stops this, right? But at this time, maybe you can educate me, but I haven't seen any illustration of significant damage done by intelligent AI systems. So I have a paper yep. which collects accidents through history of AI, and they always are proportionate to capabilities of that system. So if you have tic-tac-toe playing AI, it will fail to properly play and loses the game, which it should draw. Trivial. Your spell checker will misspell a word, so on. Uh, I stopped collecting those because there are just too many examples of AIs failing at what they are capable of. We haven't had terrible accidents in the sense of billion people got killed. Absolutely true. But in another paper, I argue that those accidents do not actually prevent people from continuing with research. And actually, they kind of serve like vaccines. Mm -hmm. A vaccine makes your body a little bit sick, so you can handle the big disease later much better. It's the same here. People will point out, you know that accident, AI accident we had where 12 people died? Everyone's still here. 12 people is less than smoking kills. It's not a big deal. So we continue. So in a way, it will actually be kind of confirming that it's not that bad. It matters how the deaths happen, whether it's literally murder by the AI system, then one is a problem. But if it's accidents because of increased reliance on automation, for example, so when uh, airplanes are flying in an automated way, maybe the number of plane crashes increased by 17% or something. And then you're like, okay, do we really want to rely on automation? I think in a case of automation airplanes, it decreased significantly. Okay, same thing with autonomous vehicles. Like, okay, uh, what are the pros and cons? What are the, what, what are the trade-offs here? And you can have that discussion in an honest way. But I think the kind of things we're talking about here is mass scale pain and suffering caused by AI systems. And I think we need to see illustrations of that on a very small scale to start to understand that this is really damaging versus Clippy, versus a tool that's really useful to a lot of people to do learning, to do um, summarization of text, to do question and answer, all that kind of stuff, to generate videos, a tool, fundamentally a tool versus an agent that can do a, lot, a huge amount of damage. So you bring up example of cars. Yes. Cars were slowly developed and integrated. If we had no cars and somebody came around and said, I invented this thing, it's called cars, it's awesome. It kills like 100,000 Americans every year. Let's deploy it. Mm -hmm. Would we deploy that? There's been fear mongering about cars for a long time from the ho the, the transition from horses to cars. There's a, there's a really nice channel that I recommend people check out, Pessimist Archive that documents all the fear mongering about technology that's happened throughout history. There's definitely been a lot of fear mongering about cars. There's a transition period there about cars, about how deadly they are. We can try. It took a very long time for cars to proliferate to the degree they have now. And then you could ask serious questions uh, in terms of the miles traveled, the benefit to the economy, the benefit to the quality of life that cars do versus the number of deaths, 30, 40,000 in the United States. Are we willing to pay that price? I think most people, when they're rationally thinking, policymakers will say yes. It's, we want to decrease it from 40,000 to zero and do everything we can to decrease it. There's all kinds of policies, incentives you can create to decrease the risks uh, with the uh, deployment of this technology, but then you have to weigh the benefits and the risks of the technology. And the same thing would be done with, with, with AI. You right. need data, you need to know, but if I'm right and it's unpredictable, unexplainable, uncontrollable, you cannot make this decision we're gaining $10 trillion of wealth, but we're losing, we don't know how many people. Uh, you, you basically have to perform an experiment on 8 billion humans without their consent. And even if they want to give you consent, they can't because they cannot give informed consent. They don't understand those things. Right, that happens when you do when you go from the predictable to the unpredictable very quickly. You just, uh, but it's not obvious to me that AI systems would 
gain capabilities so quickly that you won't be able to collect enough data to study the say, the benefits and the risks. We literally doing it. The previous model we learned about after we finished training it, what it was capable of. Let's say we stop GPT-4 training run around human capability, hypothetically. We start training GPT-5, and I have no knowledge of insider training runs or anything. And we start at that point of about human, and we train it for the next nine months. Maybe two months in, it becomes super intelligent. Mm -hmm. We continue training it. At the time when we start uh, testing it, it is already a dangerous system. How dangerous? I have no idea. But neither people training it. At the training stage, but then there's a testing stage mm -hmm. inside the company. Mm -hmm. They can start getting intuition about what the system is capable to do. Mm -hmm. You're saying that somehow from leap from GPT-4 to GPT-5 can happen the kind of leap where GPT-4 was controllable and GPT-5 is no longer controllable. And we get no insights from using GPT-4 about the fact that GPT-5 will be uncontrollable. Like that's the, that's the situation you're concerned about. Where their leap from N to N plus one would be such that an uncontrollable system is created without any ability for us to anticipate that. If we had capability of ahead of the run, before the training run, to register exactly what capabilities that next model will have at the end of the training run, and we accurately guessed all of them, I would say, you're right, we can definitely go ahead with this run. We don't have that capability. From GPT-4, you can build up intuitions about what GPT-5 will be capable of. It's just incremental progress. Mm -hmm. Even if that's a big leap in capability, it just doesn't seem like you can take a leap from a system that's uh, helping you write emails to a system that's going to destroy human civilization. It seems like it's always going to be sufficiently incremental such that we can anticipate the possible dangers. And we're not even talking about existential risk, but just the, the kind of damage you can do to civilization. It seems like we'll be able to anticipate the kinds, not the exact, but the kinds of uh, risks it might lead to, and then rapidly develop defenses ahead of time and as the risks emerge. We're not talking just about capabilities, specific tasks. We're talking about general capability to learn. Maybe like a child at the time of testing and deployment, it is still not extremely capable, but as it is exposed to more data, real world, it can be trained to become much more dangerous and capable.